Amen. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer here in just a minute for a couple of situations and things that uh, that I just I want us to continue to remember and keep on the forefront of our minds and um, just uh, sister churches that are struggling, uh, just dealing with uh, continue to deal with the loss of life that's come uh, upon them through acts of um, insaneness or whatever it may, however you would describe it. Um, but also we have a community that's uh, grieving today with the passing of one of our former music ministers and guy in, in our church for a dozen years and then uh, at Faith Church for almost eight years. So just in the Baker family and then uh, many of you um, have been in our church for a while would know uh, Janice Flood. And Janice passed away on Friday and um, she was going to First Baptist Sepulpa and the funeral will be there on Wednesday. Uh, visitation is Tuesday evening at Shouts. But we have those types of things. We have other families within our church that are just um, just dealing with the reality that um, life is fragile and it really is a gift. Um, and so I just want us to, uh, with the thought of all of these songs that we have sung, just resonating with the greatness of our God, the hope that we have in Him, that Jesus is our Messiah. Um, he is with us, uh, that, that we would pray together. But I want to tell you that I hope that the alarm doesn't go off again today uh, as I lead us in prayer because I think all of us just kind of sucked the air out of this building last Sunday if you were here and the smoke alarms go off in light of what we were praying over and all. Um, and God's sense of humor, it may very well happen again now that I've brought it up. But anyway, um, I do want us to pray together and uh, then dive into God's word. Father, today, uh, we come once again just lifting up uh, Sister Church in Texas, Lord, that uh, just continues to work through, um, Father, the events of a few weeks back. Father, other churches that are just uh, dealing with circumstances and situations, Father, in, in, in their lives, that, Father, just have the potential to, um, to totally unravel and, and just shake us. But Father, may we be reminded today that because of you and our relationship with you, uh, that Father, although the things of this earth may be shaken, uh, we have a kingdom that will never be shaken as our inheritance. And so Father, I pray that we would hold on to the solid rock of Christ Jesus. Um, that Father, he would be the foundation upon which we stand. That uh, Father, we would hold fast to him and the hope that he provides for families that are hurting and struggling to just make sense of life as it is right now. Father, we pray over them. And Father, I pray for every life that is here today. Father, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds to hear from you. Father, to continue to resonate the message that was sung through the songs. Father, we would hear truth from your word that would encourage and then, Father, where it needs to, it would convict so that the person that's here that's never trusted you as Savior and Lord could not leave this place, Father, without the hope of eternal life. So, Father, use these moments. Fulfill your purpose for this hour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians. We have been there the last couple of weeks, and we will... We will get there once again today and look at another passage of Scripture from there. But you know, today is the beginning of a week in which during this week we'll celebrate the National Day of Thanksgiving. So I hope everybody marks off at least 30 seconds on Thursday to pause and give thanks for everything that you're thankful for. That was kind of a joke. Um, but that's sometimes what we do is we hold all of our thoughts about Thanksgiving and giving those to that one day in which the, the world tells us we ought to be thankful. But the Word of God tells us that in everything, give thanks. That we're to be thankful in all circumstances. And so that's every moment of every day. And, and you know, as I think about it, that we're, we're to the middle, moving to the end of November. This year is flying by. 36 days for you to find the perfect Christmas gift for your pastor. You are listening. That's good. Three weeks until the Christmas shop. 
it's just flying by. And, and as the pace of life just seems to increase all the time, they always told us that as we got older, the years just seemed to pass quicker. And it really does happen. But I even think the younger generation sees how quickly time flies and how things change for us. So I just asked this question as a lead-in to where we're headed today. In, in light of that fastness of pace of life and the busyness of life, if you were to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, what's your gratitude meter sitting at? What are you thankful for? So, I don't know if Louie's finished counting yet or not, but I'm just going to I'm going to ask for some participation, all right? For those that were here Wednesday night, I gave you warning that this was coming, all right? There were 23 of us in church on Wednesday night, adults sitting over here, and I didn't start my lesson until we had given at least 23 things publicly that we were thankful for. So I'm going to go out on a number and say that there's 125 of us here this morning, and I am not going to continue my message until we share 125 things that we're thankful for. That's not everybody having to share, but here's what I want you to do. I just want you to start talking out loud, sharing. What are you thankful for? And just go. If there's 10 people at the same time, you go. But let's give God some thanks today. What are you thankful for? Church, ready, set, go. Man. Now, here's, here's what I would say. You should be able to just keep going and going. I told, them, I told them Wednesday night that they should have 30 seconds worth of things that they could just share that we're thankful for. You ought to be able to give a 30-second gratitude word to the people you come in contact with because God's that good and He's gooder than that, right? Amen? Y'all all right with gooder? I hope so. But uh, your motivation to give thanks right then was so that the pastor would get into his sermon, right? Our motivation to give thanks on a daily basis ought to be because God really is good and He's worthy of our praise. And so as I thought this week about what am I thankful for, even posted on Facebook just that question, what are you thankful for, and had 30-some different responses of just different folks sharing the things from all of those things that you shared, from family to health to, to just, you know, our faith in the Lord and our freedoms that we have. I mean, you, you name it, we're, it's out there. And we are grateful for those things. And that's really what I want us to, to grab again. That 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And just understand that that's what he's telling us to do, that we would give thanks in everything. It's not necessarily at the point of I'm thankful, you know, for bad health, but Lord, I'm thankful that in the bad health you taught me this. You showed me that I could count on others to be there to help me. Father, I'm not necessarily to the point of being thankful for not having um, an overabundance of finances, but God, in the midst of my financial struggle, I am thankful that you are there with me in the midst of that, that you are helping me through that time and you're providing so in in that circumstance I am thankful not necessarily thankful for what has happened um, as you distinguish between the in and the for word but Paul as he writes this letter to this group of believers in Thessalonica to this church there remember that he wants to strengthen them and encourage them he wants to give them hope he wants to give them an understanding of why they should, they should struggle through and, and, and endure through the struggles and the challenges and the problems and the persecution and all the things that they will face in their walk with Christ. It's a message that we all need, that we can be strengthened and encouraged and that we can have hope in the midst of struggle. Paul, through this letter, wants them to remember whose they are. That, 
that no matter what, they belong to the King of Kings because they are brothers and sisters in Christ. They are believers in Christ Jesus. Paul teaches us that in the, in the midst of everything that's going on, that we want to make sure that we don't let what's happening down here to allow us to lose sight of what's ahead of us up there. That's the picture for me of hope. We have hope. We have hope of something better. We have hope, something that this world cannot offer us. It is waiting for us. There are, there are, there are folks that need this message. There, there's a message of encouragement and strength and, and comfort, and it's a message of hope that is just wrapped up within the context of this a particular passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we need to understand and that we need to be able to share with the world around us. It's the message of hope that is getting Sutherland Springs, Texas church and those families through the difficulty. It's what's holding up the Baker family. It's what's going to get the Flood family through their ordeal. And it's what's gotten you through those times of which you have struggled with loss of life and just the uncertainty and the questions of everything. It's the hope that we have. It's Jesus. And it's that hope of eternal life. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. And if you would, stand with me as I read this particular passage of Scripture. The NIV version uses the word ignorant, but I'm using the ESV, my English standard, so I don't get to say that word, but I did anyway. It says in verse 13, But we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do that have no hope. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. Father, we thank you for your word and in honor of it. We praise you. You can be seated. Thank you. So you have to understand that these believers in Thessalonica, not only were they concerned about their own lives and what would happen and all this persecution that was going on, but they, they did have some con passed away. So they had questions about life and death and resurrection, and it really determined, it was determined by who they talked to or who they might listen to as to what they might hear. But as a whole, within the society in which they lived, in the community that they lived, Thessalonica was the most godless city around them. It was pagan. They didn't have. This was the first Christian witness within this city. Was this was this church that was just very young, and so they lived in a society that had no hope. There was no hope that anything past this life existed. There was nothing after death, and so Paul, seeking to encourage and comfort these believers, wanted to share with them some facts about the hope that we have in Christ. And it's that truth from Thessalonica that we want to grab a hold of and carry with us. For some of us, we know it, but we don't live life like we know it. We, we don't embrace this hope that we have, that no matter what happens to us or when it happens to us, we will spend our eternity with Him in heaven. I have that hope. It's not a wishful thinking. I have that hope because of a decision I made when I was in the seventh grade to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior because of what He had done for me. And I realized that I needed what He had to offer. And I chose to receive that free gift of salvation. I'm nobody special. It's an offer that's there for everybody. And you should have already responded to that message. And if not, you have the opportunity to do so today.
But I have responded to that message of hope and that offer of forgiveness, the free gift of salvation. And as a result of that, I don't have any concerns about where I'm going to spend my eternity. My hope is in eternal life in heaven with Him. Because we're going to spend eternity somewhere. And the world needs to know that. And the world that doesn't believe there's anything out there after death has no hope. And they don't understand the Word of God that Jesus came and He lived a perfect life and He died on the cross and He rose again three days later so that we could have an assurance of knowing that there is something more to this life than just living and breathing and dying. I have hope in Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. And on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Because all other ground is sinking sand. My hope. Paul's wanting these folks to know, hey, you, you're believers in Christ. There's been that moment and that time in your life that you've trusted Him as Savior and Lord. We are family. And we are forever family. That gets to the end of that passage of Scripture and he says, those of us that have trusted Him, we will always be with the Lord. Have hope. I'm not saying we don't grieve and we don't, and we don't hurt and we don't have all of those emotions and everything, but, but what gets us through those? He says, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, about those that are asleep and about what happens. I want you to know, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so through Jesus, God will bring with Him those that have fallen asleep. Death is not the end. The truth of the matter is, if we really want to get to it, we don't even start living until after we've died here. Life begins <laughs> when we're in His presence. This is just a snap of a finger, a blink of an eye. And that doesn't matter to me if it's 20 or if it's 60, 80 or 100 years or anywhere in between, it's still that long compared to what I'm going to spend in eternity. That word eternity going on and on and on and on and on and on, right? Never ending. I'll spend it with Him. He says, we, we have a word from the Lord. I talked about that a little bit Wednesday and not thinking it would come up today, but you know, you and I can, can spend time. You don't have to wait to come to church to get a word from the Lord. You can get a word from the Lord when you get alone with Him and you spend time with Him in the book he can speak to you, and He can share with you and encourage you. And yet, He says, you've come to this place even here. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. Here's the word, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, won't precede those that have fallen asleep, but we're going to get there. We're going to be there with them. We're going to be caught up together in the clouds, in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. For those of us that need some encouragement today, some comfort today, some strength for tomorrow, and we need it today, there it is. We ought to, this ought to charge us up and help us to face whatever it is that comes at us. That I am never left alone or forsaken, but because of my relationship with Christ, He is there with me always, and no matter what happens to me, one day I will be with Him. He is coming again and I will spend eternity with Him. That's the theme of this book, is that Christ is going to return. He talks about it in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 of chapter 2, in chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, in chapter 4, what we've just read. He talks about His coming. Christ is coming. And knowing that He's going to come back is the thing that ought to bring us comfort and give us hope. Because He's going to bring with those with him those that have died and he's going to take those of us that are here to be with him Vance Havner is a preacher of old and he said this he says you can't lose something if you know where it is and when a believer dies he's with Christ that, that gives me some comfort in the midst of losing this is a passage of scripture that is that is read or used by myself anyway at some funeral services in some context or another because I, these, these folks that have fallen asleep, they've, to be absent with the body is to be 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. These, these folks are, are, are with Christ and they're, and they're going to, to be with Him. And so, we, where we don't know the day or the hour of His return, I don't know when it's going to happen. What I do know is that when anybody sets a date and they say Christ is coming back here, I can almost mark it down that I could go to the show or do whatever I want to on that day because He's not coming back on that day. Because He says no one will know the day or the hour. It might be like that person, that one out of 468,000 million people that wins the lottery, you know, I'm at the chances of that happening. Maybe, maybe. What I do know is that Christ is going to return. And I have the hope of knowing that whenever He chooses to do so, whenever His Father says, to, hey, hey son, it's time to go get your bride, whenever that happens, I have hope because of my relationship with Him. I am ready for that day. And that's, that's the message that he's trying to get to these believers and that you and I need to hear today is that we have hope. He's going to return in the air. He's going to descend from heaven. He is coming back. And as a Christian, whether we live or die, there's no reason for us to fear because Jesus is either going to come with us or He's going to come for us. And let the fact of His return comfort you, encourage you, strengthen you, let it be something that you're thankful for. If there is, I mean, I can't necessarily say that this is the thing I'm most thankful for, but for this message, it's the thing I'm most thankful for. Is that Christ came and He lived and He died and He rose again so that I could have hope of eternal life with Him in heaven. I'm thankful for my family. Take them for granted every day. I'm thankful for food clothes. I'm thankful for all of those, and I'm thankful for a multitude of things. But what gives my life substance and meaning and, and purpose is Jesus and the hope that He offers. Listen, He says, just let me keep kind of walking through this passage of Scripture. We declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. He's coming again and then he says, for the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven. Listen, man, he's going to come with a cry. You're not going to be able to miss it. A cry from, of command, the voice of the archangel, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. One commentator tried to describe that picture of the dead in Christ will rise first. It doesn't mean that the elements of the body are going to come together again. It's resurrection, not reconstruction, was his terminology that he used. But we could turn to 1 Corinthians and read chapter 15, and speaking of the resurrection of the body, and he goes on to say, it's like the growing of a plant from a seed. The flower is not the identical seed that was planted, yet there is continuity from the seed to the plant. And Christians will receive glorified bodies like the glorified body of Christ. The dead body is the seed that is planted in the ground. The resurrection body is the flower that comes from the seed. And the other thing maybe we need to understand is one of the reasons folks struggled with this, even as they began to get a grasp of uh, the possibility of a resurrection, there was these two groups of folks. One were the Pharisees, and another group were the Sadducees. And they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That was bad, you see. But um, <laughs> really bad. But um, not even in my notes, but it was bad. Anyway, stick to the notes, preacher. Um, but they, there was this group, they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Jesus confronted them during his, his time and, and speaking to them. Jesus taught on it. The Old Testament points to it and teaches to it. Jesus Himself did it. He rose from the dead. It, it happened. And the dead in Christ will rise. And I think that that hope that there's more to this life is pictured right there, that, that death in the grave and being buried is not the end, that one day Christ is coming and I, we will be resurrected if we're dead. And if not, and we're still living when that day happens, you want to know the place I'd like to be if I'm still alive on resurrection day? I want to be at a cemetery. I, I want to see the grave. I want to see whatever's going to happen and however it's going to be because I think that's resurrection ground. 
Because the dead in Christ are going to rise. I want to see those folks that have been cremated and had their ashes spread out all over the place. I just want to, how God's going to do that. It doesn't really, it just boggles my mind. But the resurrection ground, I mean, it's a place where the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us that are still alive, we get to be caught up together in the air with them to do what? To be with the Lord forever. Life for you and I as a believer doesn't stop at the grave. Where the body might go to sleep, the soul goes to be with the Lord. And we will be with Him forever. I am thankful that there's more to this life than just this life that there's more to come, that I'm receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Caught up together to be with the Lord, and I will always be with Him. What a meeting that's going to be. When He says we'll meet the Lord in the air, the word for that, for the word meet right there is this idea that It's a meeting of a royal person that we're going to meet somebody worthy of being, of getting our attention. Someone that we're, we ought to be excited to come into their presence. It's an important person, a royal person. I can't think of anybody that fits that more than Jesus Christ. A person that's worthy for me, a royal person that I would want to meet. You know, I have hope, most and foremost, that I'm going to get to be with Jesus, my Savior, who died for me and rose again. I'm going to be in the very presence of He and the Lord. I'm going to be there. But one of the things that I also know is I'm going to be with all those other loved ones that have gone on before me. And I look forward to that day. Whether, whether I'm going to recognize or not recognize, you guys can go home and argue about that and miss the whole point of the sermon. And that's what some people do. Miss the whole point. I'm going to be with Him. No matter what this world brings me, no matter what happens to me, how I exit this world, I have hope and I am thankful that God didn't leave me here just to live and, and, and just maybe if I did enough good, I could get there. Maybe if I crossed all these T's and dotted all these I's that I'd, I'd get to heaven. No, He provided a way that I could know that my hope is in heaven and and that no no matter what happens to me, I'll spend my eternity with Him through a personal relationship with Christ. He said, Christ who came and, and, and died and rose again so that we could spend eternity with Him. So I am thankful today for the hope of heaven. I am thankful that because of my relationship with Jesus Christ, because I've asked Him to be my Savior and my Lord, that I'll spend eternity with Him. Do you have that hope? Do you have that hope? Paul's wanting these believers to understand they have that hope and that it should spur them on and encourage them and strengthen them. When he says there at the end, therefore encourage one another, your translation may say comfort. They're the same word that interchange. It's the idea that they would be, they'd put courage into one another with these words. I want you to leave encouraged, dear Christian friend. I want you to leave encouraged knowing in the midst of all that's happening and whatever may come against us, We have the hope of heaven because of what Christ did for us. And I want you to hear today, if you're here and you don't have that hope, you say, I don't know if I've done that. I don't think I've done that. I've never done that. I haven't asked Christ to forgive me of my sins. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. You can know, and you can settle that today. I can't do it for you, and the person sitting next to you can't do it for you, but you can do it. Jesus says, forever shall call upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. And those that are saved will never be separated from Him ever again. So are you thankful for your relationship with Christ? And if so, then let's get ready to tell the world. Let's let's live as if we're excited about what's to come. Not what this world has to offer 
but what the kingdom of God has to offer. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, please consider that today. Take a hold of the hope that is available to you through Jesus this morning. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your, for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus. And Father, I pray today that if there's anyone in this building, Father, that has never trusted you as Savior and Lord, there's never been that time that they have put their faith and their trust in you and asked you to forgive them of their sins and to come into their life. They haven't repented of the way they've been living life and changed directions to walk in a new life, in a new way. Father, today you'd draw them to the cross. They'd come and say, that's what I need to do. And then, Father, they would leave here knowing that Christ is their Savior, heaven is their home, and they'd have that hope from this day forward. Father, work in our lives right now. For those of us that are believers, fill us with courage, with the hope that comes from the hope of heaven, that we might live differently because of it. Use these moments. Glorify yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.